You ready? Okay, we are starting with the classic academic 15s. Uh, welcome to the new lecture in our lecture series uh, on intellectuals that we are organizing in the Institute for Labor Studies. Today with us, I'm very happy to introduce Una Blagojevic, uh, who is a doc PhD student at the Central European University and also um, a member of the research team at University Babes Boli, <laughs> Philosophy in Late Socialist Europe, and also currently a visiting fellow at the Institute of Contemporary History. And today she will speak on the positioning of intellectuals in socialist Yugoslavia, particularly around the school practice. Una, stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nessa. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so I will um, present, I will start first with, um, this is the, the topic, the, the title of my, of my not dissertation, my talk. So I will first begin by providing a very broad overview of literature, which will then help us contextualize the role of intellectuals in US of socialism. Then I will um, look into the discussions this, the surrounding the topic uh, of intellectuals in Yugoslavia. And finally, I will focus on these intellectuals around the circle of praxis, or so around the philosophical journal praxis. Um, and there I would be very much interested to see the position of philosophy in socialism and its relationship with politics, um, as well as the importance of critique or what it was called in Yugoslavia, struggle of opinion, as thematized by these intellectuals. Okay, so literature overview. Um, there is a lot here, I will not go through everything. But uh, just to kind of point out that some things um, that were helpful, or that could be helpful for contextualizing this um, topic. So one of the, uh, let's st start with Karl Mannheim. Maybe you've heard of him, so in a sociologist from writing in the 30s, 30s 1930s, um, who highlighted uh, the diversity of intellectuals and emphasized that uh, education and rather than membership to a unified social group is what binds these intellectuals together. They are, to Mannheim, they're characterized as um, free-floating or unattached. Then uh, Alvin Goldner, who actually is from different generation, he's an American sociologist writing in the 60s mainly. Um, he stated that the intellectuals not only critique established knowledge and institutions, but they also challenge the prevailing paradigms of research communities. So this distinction suggests that researchers and scientists may not inherently be considered intellectuals, but they are when they engage in this critique of a paradigm. And then we have a more historical study by Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Kramer, who delves deeper into this notion of intellectuals in the sense that he questions whether the role of intellectuals is primarily critical and transformative, challenging cultural assumptions or politi and political powers, or if it tends towards providing legitimization and technical support uh, for existing cultural and political systems. So Kramer's inquiry focuses on the function of intellectuals, examining whether they're primarily serving as critiques or, as he says, experts within society. And now another thing in literature that is uh, interesting, I think, to mention here is um, are the debates concerning the role or differences in the role between uh, intellectuals in Eastern Europe or intelligentsia versus intellectuals in Western Europe. Um, Christopher Scharl, um, for instance, suggests that the term intellectuals originated in France during 1890s, emphasizing its emergence in, as a new social and cultural figure within the historical and social context of the turn of the century. In contrast, in Eastern Europe, the concept of uh, intelligentsia uh, emerged earlier, around the mid-19th century, but under different circumstances. And here, Zygmunt Bauman, who was a Polish sociologist and philosopher, discussed the formation of a Russian intelligentsia and the subsequent rise of local and national intelligentsias across Eastern and Central Europe. And he noted that this region, uh, I quote, was well behind its counterpart by all standards of economic and political development. It had neither crushed its peasantry nor politically disposed its aristocracy. And by uh, ba Bauman, 
um, compares the histories of this emergence of intellectuals versus intelligentsia, claiming that, and I put a quote here, that intelligentsia in East Central Europe was from its very inception confronted with the task of constructing a political body capable of effective action instead of merely converting the already existing um, state uh, machinery to its rationalizing purposes. Um, so basically this kind of, according to him, puts the intelligentsia um, in a different position to power. Um, now we go to um, socialism or kind of in li literature dealing with this period of that we are interested in today. And in relationship to socialism, Catherine Verdery, who, was, um, who is an American anthropologist, offers uh, another perspective, um, raising questions about the role of intellectuals in shaping discourses and identities, such as construction of Romanian identity after 1945 and their relationship with the leadership of communist parties. She defines intellectuals as, and I quote, Ocup oh, sorry. Uh, occupants of a side that, that is privileged in forming and transmitting discourses, in constituting thereby the means through which society is taught by its members. End of quotation. Um, another worthwhile study uh, here to mention is um, the book by um, uh, Ivan Seleni and George, Co George Conrad, um, which aimed to, in a way, reassess or kind of rethink or su supplement Milovan Gilles' analysis of a uh, new class. And Seleni and Conrad suggest that during the desalinization, um, so the period and the su subsequent reform in socialist bloc in the 1960s, the circle of those in power in state socialist societies began to broaden. So the expansion included intellectuals of various backgrounds, ranging from humanities to technocrats, who merged with the bureaucrats in position of authority. And in the Yugoslav context, what is interesting uh, to what is important to mention here, in particular in connection to Serbian intellectuals, um, are the insights regarding their role in creating nationalist discourses that were um, studied by Jasna Dragović Soso, for example. Specifically in Serbia, um, next to Soso, uh, Dragović Soso, Nick Miller also writes about this topic, um, arguing that uh, in Serbia it was the intellectuals who created the narrative of uh, Serbian victimization. So this generation of Serbian intellectuals, including historians, philosophers, writers, poets, constructing uh, a narrative, portraying Serbs as perennial victims of persecution by their neighbors, which ultimately fuel sentiments leading to war. So the intellectuals created these discourses of national victimization, and this was then taken by the, the leadership, in the case of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic. And um, in all of these studies, there is, uh, so the studies dealing with intellectuals in socialism, there, there is a somehow implied question of do intellectuals in social systems occupy a distinct and unique position? Um, so very briefly, I um, mean, kind of went through it very uh, quickly through this literature, and there's much more to cover here, of course, but um, these, what I've said so far, mainly looks at the intellectuals from sociological and historical points of view, and the questions that it raises, I think, are useful to bear in mind when we explore the intellectual involvement in socialist Yugoslavia, and these include roles like their roles as critiques or experts, for example, their contributions in shaping and changing paradigms, creating discourses and so on. Uh, my own interest uh, mainly, and I will mention it actually in passing towards the end more, is uh, the intellectual participation in creating a discourses of crisis, of first of philosophy, a Marxist philosophy, and then of a system, so socialist system, towards the end, uh, to towards the 80s, which merged more on political and spiritual crisis. But I will today focus mainly on their engagement in the 60s. Um, and let's now move to this um, part, uh, yeah, so intellectuals in the 60s and reflection of intellectuals in the 60s in Yugoslavia. Firstly, the problem of intellectuals, as it was termed in Yugoslavia, had its history and background. So the problem was that there was no Marxist comprehensive theory of intellectuals. Uh, and Alvin Goldner, whom I mentioned, the sociologist, who, by the way, also came to Yugoslavia around the 60s as well, uh, said that this lack of uh, Marxist theory of intellectuals is not an oversight, but that the lack reflected the impossibility of it ever constructing one. 
So the relationship between intellectuals and workers, according to Goldner, is that intellectual is that of intellectual domination and proletarian subordination. As Marxism demands that workers submit to theory and thus to the authority of those who are the workers' movement theoreticians. So this is according to Goldner. Uh, Goldner claims that this was a contradiction in Marxism from the start, an internal one, and uh, that uh, this is the, as he says, and I quote, paradox authority of intellectuals in the workers' movement. Um, in Yugoslavia, in the context of the general criticism of Stalinist practices in period after 49, 48, um, the, um, the, the intellectuals were in a way encouraged to build socialism and also to develop Marxist thought. For example, at the occasion of uh, the introduction of the law of self-management in 1950, Josip Broz Tito uh, uh, claimed, uh, expressed that it was the intellectuals who were needed to explain and revise Marxist positions in order to move away from Stalinist deformations. So in this context, various institutions were opened, research institutes, for example, and the number of those educated uh, the university was drastically increasing. This was really the, indeed, the very accelerated transformation of the structure in the structure of Yugoslav society. Yet, notwithstanding this, it was still very much unclear who are the intellectuals, who are the socialist intellectuals, and their position in Yugoslav society was a matter of debate. And to this need to explicate and understand the place of intellectuals in development of socialist relationship in Yugoslavia was expressed at a gathering organized by the journal Gledište in the 1960. So here is just the first uh, page of the, uh, with the table of contents, which is kind of the discussion of who was participating there. And um, it was recorded and published by, by the journal. And the problem of intellectuals as organizers um, of, of this debate explained, uh, had both theoretical and practical importance. And some of the interest put forward here as the questions, leading questions were, and I'm paraphrasing more or less, what are the social economic positions of intellectuals in Yugoslav society? So this was one of the questions that was point, raised. Is the contemporary intelligentsia indeed a distinct social stratum, uh, largely different from, the, uh, from other segments of society? And lastly, who constitutes the intelligentsia and who should be classified as such? Uh, so one challenge they um, encountered when addressing these questions was exactly this lack of fully developed uh, Marxist theory regarding intelligentsia. Nevertheless, one of the um, authors, uh, participants, Mi uh, Milosev, Milosev Janicevic, was actually one of the first um, exploring the role of intelligentsia in Yugoslavia from this historical perspective, provided an overview of the topic by pointing out at some issues. So Yanichiri's starting question was there, whether there has been a shift in the structure of intellectuals following World War II, and if so, what characterized this change? So how was intelligentsia different in socialism? And challenging the idea that intellectuals inherently look down on manual labor and remain detached from the masses, he argued that in Yugoslavia, the intelligentsia actually very readily adapted to changing circumstances. Um, the reason for that, as he says, that intellectuals recognize the necessity of aligning their aspirations with those of the masses, so working towards liberal, national and social liberation. But um, also another reason was, as he says, there was a scarcity of intellectuals in Yugoslavia and that hindered their ability to kind of group and create this sort of specific cohesive group that would exert social influence. However, the situation, he said, was changing um, very fast, and there was a high and quick rise of intell intellectuals in Yugoslavia. And here, on the other side, you see the, some statistical data he provided. What he observed here is that uh, there was a decline in the number of graduates in law and philosophy in comparison to the previous period, and that then there was an increase in those completing studies in economics, medicine, and technical fields. So this was indicating exactly this shift uh, in the professional composition of the Yugoslav intelligentsia. 
and Yonichievich intellectuals were moving towards expert knowledge, as he said. Um, he observed, observed that the creative intellectuals, traditionally perceived as intellectuals, still retained an elite status in the society with some functions that are not significantly different from those at the end of the 19th century. However, he also noted changes in the structure. What he said is that the role of a writer was no longer measured by standards from decades past, from 50, 60 years ago. Instead of representing, as he said, collective aspiration of the people, writers involved into specialists who created aesthetic values. Uh, Yanichievich argued that it was not by chance that the contemporary writers were dubbed as uh, the engineers of human souls. Additionally, um, as he said, while philosophers and social theorists in the 19th century were focused on creating new systems and visions, their contemporary role has shifted towards that of specialists in organizing diverse forms of social, political, and economic activity. Essentially, um, as Anichievich argued, philosophers and social scientists have become experts in addressing the complexities of social mechanisms and problem solving within society. So next to the change in structure of Yugoslav intelligentsia, there was another question that was raised uh, by Mikhailo Markovic, who would be one of the future praxis uh, philosophers. He comes from Belgrade. And he, um, he actually was wondering how, you know, what was exactly socialist intelligentsia. He says that we all agree that we're building intelligentsia, intellectuals in Yugoslavia, and that there are a considerable portion of intellectuals can be labeled as socialists, but he found this uh, terminology problematic because it was employed in the USSR in a very optimistic way, meaning that everybody who was um, you know, everybody who was intellectual in socialism was straight away a socialist intellectual. But he said that if we consider their social background, history, and political stance, this characterization would often be very restrictive. So should everyone truly be considered a socialist intellectual in, uh, in socialism, as Jorge Goricher, Slovenian sociologist, for example, at this meeting mentioned, or perhaps not? So Markovic further expressed the satisfaction uh, with the current state of intellectuals in Yugoslavia, identifying several shortcomings. First, he lamented the absence of well-established intellectuals proficient in Marxist philosophy. And at the time, in these early uh, 50s, I mean, even early 60s, not all works by Marx and classics of Marxism were translated into Serbo-Croatian, mainly they first started translating into Serbo-Croatian. Um, uh, so this was also one of the, the, problem, the problems as well that they were facing. But uh, not only that, there were not enough um, those who were understanding or kind of learning or knew as, uh, anything about aesthetics, contemporary arts. And he highlighted that there, this was necessary in order to combat the negative literary trends that were infiltrating Yugoslav literature from abroad. This was, this was his um, kind of criticism. Uh, furthermore, he noted the lack of initiative among intellectuals to cultivate, as he said, general culture in Yugoslavia among the masses, attributing it to low ra rates of reading. Uh, Markovic also criticized the commercialization of Yugoslav intellectuals, uh, where the pursuit of profit undermined their sense of purpose in educating and enriching society. And he says that excessive involvement in public discourse was another point uh, that was problematic, uh, where, um, and this is why he advocated a more balanced role in political uh, roles uh, as political intellectuals. Um, and he was recognizing the significance of bringing, bridging the gap between uh, worker, working class and intellectuals, but nevertheless, he argued that, that the creative intelligentsia is often very much diverted from its primarily role because they are very much engaged in other societal functions. Um, so these are some examples uh, of issues that were raised at this uh, meeting in 1960, where intellectuals were grappling with their role um, uh, in Yugoslav society, highlighting various challenges and concerns. Um, now uh, we can shift towards uh, philosophy or towards 
um, philosophy in relationship to socialism. And there is a lot uh, to, to unpack here, but I will focus on some uh, aspects. Um, in the 1950s, early 1950s, there was a notable shift in the perception of philosophy as a discipline, uh, previously labeled as bourgeois. So during this period, many philosophical institutes and societies were uh, reopened or established across Yugoslavia. And um, in commemorating the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution, the introductory text published in the official journal of the University of Zagreb called Nashe Teme, Our Topics, in 1957, titled Humanism of a Revolution, outlined the role of philosophy in socialism. Philosophy's objective was to unveil the essence of the contemporary crisis. This was written by the editorial. Um, the text also emphasized that the crisis could only be truly understood through a perspective rooted in global um, changes, and philosophy somehow had this all-encompassing uh, purview of, of this. Uh, events or kind of understanding of the events. Mere contemplation or passive acceptance, um, acceptance of the crisis was not a solution. Rather, understanding uh, uh, and addressing the crisis required a revolutionary mindset. mindset. So to fulfill one's historical duty as a human being meant embracing a revolutionary spirit. So this was what was kind of put uh, the, in the first um, um, first text by the editorial of Nashe, Nashe Teme. Uh, moreover, at the time and in the context of criticism of Stalinist interpretation of Marxism, Leninism, the Yugoslav party also turned to classics of Marxism. And it was in this context that the place and meaning of young Marx in Marxism was tightly linked with the question of Marx as a philosopher and implicitly the position of philosophy in socialist society. Uh, the effort in the 1950s, as I mentioned, was to reinstitute philosophy as an autonomous discipline. And soon in the 1960s, for these intellectuals, it was crucial the philosophy uh, not to be connected to politics in a way that it either plays an apologetic or a positional role. To stress this point, at the meeting organized in 1967 uh, during a discussion philosophy in a contemporary society that was organized by journal Gladishta in Belgrade, Zdravko Kucinar, philosopher, uh, assessed the development of philosophy in Yugoslavia in the following way. Uh, so I'll read this quotation. He said, uh, the development of philosophy allows more dialogue and confronting of opinion. The last decade of Marxist philosophy was moving mainly in interpretation. So they were trying to kind of, you know, start afresh the interpretation of Marx because uh, to kind of save it from the distortions done by Stalin from their perspectives. Uh, that is reinterpretation of Marx and the discovering of the meaning of theory of alienation and her exploration in the critique of contemporary world and in our society. This allowed us to understand in a more critical way the development of socialism to uncover the shapes and forms of alienation in our existing socialism. So what is maybe here important to take is that exactly this rediscovering of a concept of alienation was something that then they started to also apply on socialist societies as well, not only on to capitalists, but also kind of started reflecting on it uh, in terms of you know, alienation in Yugoslav socialism as well. Uh, philosophy's main um, role, uh, according to these intellectuals, was to bring about liberation of men, of human beings, as Kuchinar and his colleagues uh, would argue. Uh, this, uh, then in connection with the theory of alienation, had a strong political aspect, since the uncovering of the category of alienation involved a practical activity in social society next to a theoretical use. And in 1964, when a group of intellectuals from Zagreb Faculty of Philosophy founded the um, Praxis uh, Journal, uh, philosophical journal, they made a crucial distinction that this was not just another philosophical publication, but rather one, the one committed to engage philosophy. And here in the first uh, number of Praxis, uh, why Praxis, they give this you know, kind of explanation why, <laughs> um, and I will read it. 
So despite of abundance of journals, it seems to us that we don't have the one that we want, a philosophical journal that isn't nearly expert, and you can think about what we were, I mean, at the beginning, this sort of expert or, yeah, um, expert, a philosophical journal that is not just philosophical, but also discusses the actual problems of Yugoslav socialism, the contemporary world and man. Um, we don't want a philosophical journal in traditional sense, nor do we want some general theoretical magazine without a central thought and without physiognomy. So um, one of the... Um, uh, so, okay, I will continue, sorry. There is another part that is important to mention here. So a little bit further, they also said that one of the main sources of failures and deformation of socialist theory and practice during the last decades should be sought in the overlooking of the philosophical dimension of Marxist thought in overt and covert negation of its humanist essence. Um, and so initially their engagement was not necessarily entailing political involvement, but rather a committee to addressing social issues or not social issues so per se but sort of reflecting on uh, exactly on this like creeping alienation in of society uh, or not, uh, not insufficient functioning of self-management in Yugoslavia but also in their um, kind of argument that um, humanism um, or humanist aspects of, of Marx uh, Marxist thought should be put as one of the the most important um, on the agenda um, and um, practice in cultural summer school, which was affiliated with the, the, the journal, uh, they were both international and they served as platforms facilitating this organized um, engagement for philosophers, although they were not the only ones in Yugoslavia. And I think this should be mentioned and emphasized uh, that there were various other platforms that uh, exactly Serve for this um, for these purposes. For example, Association of Philosophers in Yugoslavia, or Association of Sociologists as well, and different societies across uh, the republics. But Praxis really gained this sort of prominence beyond Yugoslav borders because they were bringing all these very renowned philosophers from Marcuse. Um, um, Habermas and others who were um, thinking, who were joining the sessions at the Cultural Summer School every August. Um, however, later on, as you probably know, because of their criticism of Yugoslav political system, um, the, the school and the journal were be um, closed down. Not closed, but they would just not be founded. F uh, founded. Um, from the start of their public involvement, Praxis philosophers cautioned against the perils of subjugating philosophy to politics. They cited the example of USSR, where philosophy was welded to bolster uh, Stalinist ideology. Uh, Gaia Petrovich asserted, uh, for example, he is also one of the philosophers from Praxis, uh, that the primary responsibility of philosophers in socialism was to foster critical thinking, not only directed uh, inward towards philosophers themselves, whom he argued and he saw as a distinct stratum within society, but also outward at politics uh, and anyone else seeking to maintain a privileged position within society. Which then brings us to uh, another uh, issue concerning uh, the position of philosophy and socialism, and that is its relationship to politics. So this concern uh, that was perceived by philosophers, it was not no, uh, novel, as they said, it dated back to Plato. They observed that in many socialist nations, uh, societies, philosophy is subordinated to politics, um, a phenomenon they deemed contradictory to the principles advocated by Karl Marx. Gaio Petrovich here uh, posed the question, and I quote, is there a flaw inherent in Marx's ideas, or is it the problematic relationship between philosophy and politics in socialism that is to blame for the crisis of Marxist philosophy? Ivan Kovacic, another philosopher from Praxis, responded to this uh, in a way saying that um, the hindrances, uh, the main obstacles to development of philosophy in Yugoslavia were to be found in the centers of power in Yugoslavia that were still, in a way, exemplified by Stalinism. So see, he suggested the Yugoslav political system still has some traces, remnants of Stalinism. And actually, uh, a bit later, when they started to openly criticize the, 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 the political system in Yugoslavia, they would call it Stalinist anti-Stalinism. 
Um, and here are some of the Kovacs' grievances pointing to a crisis of philosophy as well as the political system in, in, in Yugoslavia. And I will paraphrase it. So basically he's saying that the, the thinking, the thought became pragmatic, uh, reducing human experience to mere calculations rather than focusing on the individual. We see, as he says, emphasis on, of, on numerical efficiency in all aspects of life. Everything is expected to operate within the rigid system. In response to this true philosophy, that he saw true philosophy is being overshadowed by a focus on programming and technical optimization. Um, so you see this like very, uh, very, um, uh, how to say, um, very dark uh, image of, of, of uh, thinking in Yugoslavia at the time. And as a footnote, actually, such insights were very much found in the anal analysis of Western thinkers of their Western capitalist societies and modernity as such. So from leftist oriented to those not leftist oriented, like for example, Herbert Marcuse or Eric Fromm or C. Wright Mills. And they, these philosophers also draw on ideas from Karl Jaspers and Martin Heidegger. These authors express critiques of modern societies, highlighting the significance of authentic freedom and the unhindered creativity of individuals. So in this context of crisis um, that was an overarching menace, the task of philosophers was to bring about the awareness among masses. And again, we find this argument um, among different philosophers of praxis. One of example for, uh, is uh, Milovan, uh, sorry, Miladin Zivotic, who referred to Jose Ortega y Gasset's liberal critique of modern mass democracy in his Revolt of the Masses from 1932 in order to reflect on, on the present day circumstances in Yugoslavia, where he implicitly referred to the discussions concerning the primacy of collectivism over the individual and social society that stifle creative and independent thinker, thinking. So in order to avoid the crisis of Europe, which Ortega y Gasset described, uh, which was due to the fact that the man masses are gaining more and more social power. His solution that also Zivotic also appropriated was that the cultural elite was supposed to serve as an avant-garde and in a social society. Zivotic contrasted the theory of cultural elite proposed by um, Ortega y Gasset with the theory of people's culture that was elaborated and defined by the Soviet philosophers. The crisis at the time, and this is already mid-60s, was very much in the air, around 1968 especially, and philosophers often citing and referencing uh, in this context uh, phenomenologist Edmund Husserl, who saw philosophy to be an answer to the crisis in his seminal work from 1936, the crisis of European sciences and transcendental phenomenology, which was interestingly also published in, in Belgrade in this interwar period. Uh, especially in the context of 1968, philosophy was perceived by these intellectuals not only as knowledge or cognition, but it was supposed to be some sort of a utopia. Without this utopia, uh, as I said, there was no inspiration for the revolutionary action. Ljubil Mirtadic, uh, another philosopher from Praxis, expressed agreement with Herbert Marcuse's perspective on the potential for transcending the existing state of the world. He outlined two possible stances. One involves accepting reality as inevitable and unchangeable, leading to passive resignation. The other is a utopian position that demands radical change. Tadic described the events of June 1968 um, as similar occurrences and similar occurrences as attempts by Yugoslav society to engage within the broader European and global realities. As he said, the student movements carry the utopian element, perceiving the world as hermetically closed with no way out. So the situation prompted the question, what next? What should be addressed here is that there was a growing uh, discourse of crisis within philosophy during the 60s. And uh, Svetozor Stojanovic, another philosopher from Praxis, for instance, described the state of crisis as a state of exhaustion marked by repetitive themes devoid of innovation. He suggested that this stagnation was reflective of broader trend, indicating the loss of philosophical autonomy and subjugation of philosophical discourse to political agendas. Which brings us now to the final part, and that is the part on critique. As I mentioned earlier, um, the program of 1958 of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia was often cited among uh, the intellectuals. 
Uh, to them, this program uh, provided uh, some sort of direction and their engagement in building social social, uh, use of socialism. And here are some parts that um, refer to education, science, and culture. That, uh, and I quote, so the, the essential characteristics of uh, development of culture, creative abilities of the people are um, liberating educational, scientific, artistic, and cultural life from administrative interference by authorities, from status and pragmatist conceptions of cultural creativity by creating and perfecting a system of social self-management and educational scientific and other cultural institutions and organizations. And uh, this is exactly the program where this sort of um, critique or uh, struggle of opinion was kind of put as an important aspect of, of, of uh, direction of Yugoslav socialism. However, this exactly sparked the debate whether what is the balance between maintaining ideological uni unity on one hand and the struggle of opinions on the other. It was widely accepted the struggle of opinions was essential for the advancement of Marxist thought, but it was also important to preserve this ideological unity. The main question was then uh, whether the struggle of opinion inevitably leads to ideological fragmentation, or if it can instead lead to a rational form of unity through the process of debate and discussion. And one of the main um, motto of Praxis philo philosophers, and again outlining their agenda in the first number, was the critique of everything existing, uh, all existing conditions, uh, that they draw inspiration from Marx himself. This involvement um, kind of in, this involved a critique of the status quo, emphasizing the necessity for questioning and challenging all aspects of existing societal structures. And they maintained that uh, Marx advocated for the critical examination of all existing conditions, not as a means to deny and reject things, but rather as a pathway to affirmation, uh, facilitating the development and progress of social conditions. So Marxism was only powerful, as the praxis intellectuals would argue, when it used this principle of critique of all existing. Without such critique, they argued, it falls into positivism and pragmatism, something that they blamed the Yugoslav uh, socialist systems uh, at some point, towards the, um, in, from the mid-60s onwards. It becomes an apology for everything existing, for status quo, and everything is being proclaimed as positive and necess necessary, as they said. Um, the critique is mainly uh, hindered by the bureaucrats in Yugoslavia, according to Branko Bosniak, and against the critique they fight in the name of higher goals. And the higher goals here are precisely to protect the ideological unity and protect and conserve Marx. However, Bosniak argued that that bureaucratic class that still existed in Yugoslavia uh, was bearing by this way everything that was revolutionary. Marxist thought was then stifled and instrumentalized for the benefit of those in power. Uh, so Marxist thought was not to be put in this box, but it was supposed to be constantly developed as if it was always, in a way, in some crisis. Um, so therefore, among philosophers, the struggle of opinion was perceived to be the, of the utmost importance, um, as Svetozar Stojanovic uh, noted. Um, they perceive their main responsibility as intellectuals to constantly challenge socialist society with humanist values and objectives that the society should aspire to achieve. Essentially, the intellectuals represented, um, you know, uh, the, uh, in their view, a specific stratum in the society, um, use of society, and their role was to exactly spread this critical thinking and to be the first to challenge prevailing ideologies, thereby disrupting this sort of um, ideological unity. Stojanovic viewed uh, intellectuals as guiding society, acting as avant-garde and enlightened elite. However, by the late 60s, many Marxists around this circle began to assert that the definition of Marxism and socialism had become unclear. And this was both positive and negative. Positive because Marxism was supplemented with contemporary insights and theories, and thus historicized. Negative precisely because being a Marxist was not always clear. Uh, Mikhailo Markovic, for example, emphasized that Marxist philosophy could not be confined to a singular philosophical approach, but it has to kind of be always in dialogue with other streams of thought. Um, and now, one of the things that should be included here in this um, kind of praxis story is the critique of praxis. And in 1970s, uh, Fuad Muhic, who was a philosopher, um, kind of criticized praxis 
uh, that their uh, critique of all existing did not necessarily have to align strictly with Marxist positions, but it could exactly encompass various positions from anarchist, liberal, conservative, and others. Uh, for this reason, for from for Muhic's perspective, he was a philosopher from Sarajevo, I should mention. Um, Marxist humanism was then divorced from its historical context, leading to uncritical abstraction and potentially drifting towards dogmatism. As, um, as he claimed. Furthermore, under the banner of abstract academic freedom, some intellectuals whose leftist stance was unquestionable uh, gave moral support to platforms with deeply reactionary implications in Yugoslav society, and this is many nationalists. Fod Muhic saw this as an inevitable outcome of an overtly, um, overly abstract position in the critique of all existing. Uh, and he wrote, how else to explain uh, Mikhail Djuric, who was one of the philosophers from Praxis Journal from uh, Belgrade, how else to, to explain this tradition of Marxist humanism at the same time joining all elements of nationalism and right-wingism? Um, in 1972, by the way, Mikhail Djuric was accused uh, for hostility to uh, Yugoslav unity and Serbian nationalism and condemned to two years in jail. Uh, Muhic uh, further contended that following significant international intellectual um, and political events around 68, Praxis philosophers uh, claimed themselves to be true Marxists in relationship to um, you, the official narrative, uh, for official Marxism. Uh, they positioned themselves as representatives of an alternative Marxist ideology aiming to dismantle the bureaucratic proletarian party and advocating for more direct forms of uh, political interaction. Yet what Muhic wondered was um, whether a philosopher indeed can be a politician and whether when a philosopher becomes a politician would not he or she inherit the same political logic that the politician had. So in conclusion, the role of intellectuals within socialism remained ambiguous, prompting them to reflect on their position and occasionally leverage it to assert their expertise. As circumstances demanded their involvement, the intellectuals also participated in creating a discourse of crisis and in a way further compelling their engagement, which they saw primarily as critique. In addition, the Marxism they endorsed was gradually adopting more and more minimalistic uh, definition. Uh, finally, with um, Ljubo Mirtadic claiming that, that he identified as Marxist only to the extent that it entailed a critique of all existing conditions. So I would finish this, and I'm looking forward to any questions you will have. And I'm sorry I'm having this the, the <laughs> kind of doing this all the time. If I'm looking towards you, that will be all. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Una. Now let's wait for the light so we're able to actually see. <laughs> but we can try. If anyone has any question from the top, you're welcome. Ah, perfect. You're welcome to ask. If not, I will start. <laughs> As the classic role of the moderator. Uh, so I'm actually, you focused on the 60s now, but I know you do research the later years as well. Um, and since they were spouting very individualistic views from the beginning, uh, when did they turn into a more nationalist discourse then? Mm -hmm. Or how did they turn into a more nationalist discourse in the end? Mm. Okay, uh, well, thanks for your question. <laughs> I, it, it's not an easy question to answer, <laughs> and if, of course, depends. So, first of all, praxis were not a unified yeah. group of people, so there were different, and not all of them adopted these philosophical um, and political nationalist positions. But um, I think from the like, I think that some of there are some turning points or like some parts where they kind of really started to become more and more radical in their um, critique of Yugoslav socialism that then in a way very easily could also open up the nationalist discourses. One was the first, like the, 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 the economic reforms that they really um, said that from that point on, the Yugoslav political elite kind of gave up its uh, promise uh, of really decentralizing uh, Yugoslav society 
through self-management, not simply the workers um, in the factories, but also on the level of the state. Uh, and that, that exactly introduced this egoist, egoistic uh, kind of perceptions um, and so on. And then, um, and then exactly around this period of the changes of the constitution in the 74, uh, and this is actually the reason why this guy, um, uh, Juric, um, started expounding exp this um, Serbian nationalism. Um, so I would say, I mean, it depends. Uh, of course, we all know Mihailo Markovic being one of the most radical in, in this, but at some point, I think there's um, different intellectuals in a way already kind of um, around mid-60s, I would say. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Um, so I was wondering, like you mentioned, that there, they, they've had these um, influences from like Western Marxism and even like Heideggerian influences. Um, was like some sort of a, a anti technological perspective like universal to, to this practice, the Praxis group, or was like that like just a um, I think that some disappeared because of these influences. Because I think it's some, somewhat funny how, how um, especially philosophers in like uh, in, in in certain Marxist uh, circles uh, always tend to like tend to to, to reactionary uh, positions in in. Um, in relations to technology. Mm. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, actually, this uh, technology, um, um, the, the their perceptions of the or yeah debates on technology and exactly how they get in all the other like let's say uh, anti-technology people or anti-modernists, they were very much found in the writing in the readings of, of the group, and they really uh, followed closely, especially those. Uh, People, not only philosophers, but also sociologists writing about the so-called technological civilization or the age of organiz organization. And this was very much debated and very closely followed. But I find it very interesting that they, in a way, adopted these sort of criticisms of highly advanced Western capitalist societies without really critical kind of, they didn't really somehow they did not, they adopted it to their own context, Yugoslav context, which was nowhere close to that. But they, all, they were criticizing from that perspective. They were seeing really Yugoslav socialism, especially after these reforms, and, you know, kind of going towards that direction. And there are a lot of anti-modernist perspectives among uh, praxis. So that's where, yes, I would say it was something that was very much found in their um, discourse. Any more questions? <laughs> mm -hmm. Your presentation focused mainly on Belgrade and Zagreb as uh, two biggest intellectual cities, of course, in Yugoslavia. Mm. But what was happening in the smaller cities? Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. I mean, because there was yeah. a lot of universities. Yes, in yeah. it was not just exactly. Domain. Totally. No, I fully agree. And this is actually one of the, let's say, limits of my, uh, I mean, when I started writing my dissertation, I really wanted to decenter Belgrade and Zagreb from this discussion and historiography because it has been always focused and in praxis as well. But you're very right to say, you, you know, in, even in Serbia, like small cities like Niš University, they also had their journals. So there was a lot. Um, I was very much also interested in Pristina when the Pristina University was discovered, uh, discovered, um, established. Um, but I, I really don't know much about that. I was mainly focusing on Belgrade and Zagreb and it would be nice to know more about Ljubljana, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I would say that there, there was a lot of things happening uh, outside of these main centers, uh, university centers, because they all also had journals and they were publishing, but I have not been able to go through that. 
Well, the main reaction the moment of the planet is not ended yet, and it started slightly later. <laughs> in terms of, yeah, <laughs> we don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, any more questions? And then I'm yeah. <laughs> um, and the second question would be regarding the dissidents mm. and um, some of the intellectuals were also seen as dissidents and such um, from the perspective of the Communist Party. Mm. Um, did you consider maybe um, focusing on their dossiers in the secret police? Mm -hmm. Because there was there is this book you should you, you know from Yuri Donshak about dissidents in Slovenia and there it was and the Udbach had this really um, detailed um, analysis of everyone and um, they also tried to, to mm -hmm. put him into some kind of um, ideological field or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so did you maybe consider using this also as a source? For mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good point. I was not actually, because for example, so the approach that I'm taking in the dissertation in my research is intellectual history, which mainly look, I mean, I mainly, my, my sources, let's say, are exactly these publications found in journals in their, you know, manuscripts and so on. And also I'm consulting archives in terms of, I'm interested in, con, con, you know, uh, correspondences in some of these. Uh, this question of dissidents is also really interesting because Praxis were called dissidents, especially by this very, still, I think, the best you know, in English uh, and very comprehensive study by Gerson, Gerson Scher on the dissidents, um, Yugoslav praxis dissidents, something like that. Um, but, uh, but I think one can ask whether this, or I, I'm mainly talking about praxis, right? So I would question whether they actually are dissidents. I mean, they did not call themselves dissidents and when they were called by uh, the outsiders, mainly as dissidents, they were kind of rejecting that label. And I'm not sure, if, I mean, in comparison to other socialist countries, they were really not uh, prosecuted. I mean, they were they lost their jobs at the university, for example, of Belgrade, but then they established an institute for them. and. You know, it was in a way they, they lost one job, but they got the institute. Okay, it's not the best, it's not the most uh, privile uh, kind of elite, you're not a professor, but you still have a job <laughs> and you're not in jail. But it's a good question. I mean, it will be interesting maybe to look at this exactly. I'm sure there is something on them in this uh, Udba documents, but yeah, maybe, maybe later. <laughs> Any more questions? If not, Una, thank you very much. Thanks. It was great. Uh, we will see each other not next week. Next week we will see each other at a different event, uh, and that is the protest on the 1st of May. And But the week later, on the 8th of May, May we continue. And this is <laughs> thank you.